everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this video, we're going to solve questions and highlight important facts about lumbar puncture for the boats. Since we're at the lower back, I will also tell you how to differentiate conus medullaris syndrome from cauda equina syndrome. If you're interested in medical videos, quizzes, clinical experiences, and Q&A sessions, do subscribe to my YouTube channel and join my med journey. A lumbar puncture is basically a procedure that is done to obtain a sample of the cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid protects the brain, provides nourishment, and also plays a role in removing waste. Besides, it can also be used for diagnosing diseases. When a lumbar puncture is done, we usually measure the opening pressure, color and appearance of the fluid, WBC count, protein levels, glucose levels, and also the presence of virus and bacteria. Question number one. Where is the lumbar puncture done? Option A, between L1 and L2. Option B, between L2 and L3. Option C, between L4 and L5. Option D, between S2 and S4. These are the lumbar vertebrae. This is the anterior part and this is the posterior part. This is the spinal cord. The spinal cord is covered by meninges. The meninges have three layers, dura, arachnoid and pia. The meninges contain cerebrospinal fluid. If we look at one vertebra from the top, this is what it'll look like. This canal is where the spinal cord passes through. The goal of performing a lumbar puncture is to obtain cerebrospinal fluid without damaging the spinal cord. Remember that the spinal cord in adults ends somewhere around the level of L1. Below that, we have two structures which we will talk about in the second part of this video. The layer containing cerebrospinal fluid extends up to S2. So, we should insert our needle in such a way that we don't damage the spinal cord and at the same time are able to obtain enough sample. The optimal position is between L3 and L5. You can use the mnemonic between 3 and 5 keeps the cord alive. Now that we know the location, we need to know how deep we have to go. So question number 2. Lumbar puncture obtains fluid from Option A, subdural space. Option B, subarachnoid space. Option C, epidural space. Option D, spinal nerve ganglia. The brain and spinal cord are surrounded by meninges. The CSF is produced by the choroid plexus in the fourth and lateral ventricles. It flows through the lateral ventricles, then to the third ventricle, then to the fourth and ends up in this layer. Since it is below the arachnoid, it is known as the subarachnoid space. So, while performing a lumbar puncture, we obtain fluid from the subarachnoid space. Question number three. A 35 year old female presents with headache, which is worse at night for the past three months. You suspect an increased intracranial pressure. What will you do next? A head CT to check for lesions or a lumbar puncture to drain the excessive cerebrospinal fluid. Doing a lumbar puncture to drain excessive cerebrospinal fluid does sound logical, but it should not be done before performing a head CT. This is because, in case there's a space occupying lesion in the brain, performing a lumbar puncture can lead to poor distribution of the CSF in the head and can pull the brain parenchyma. This can lead to herniation of the brain, which is very dangerous. So, always do a CT or an MRI to rule out lesions before performing a lumbar puncture in such cases. Question number 4. Symptoms of which of the following does not improve with a lumbar puncture? Option A. Meningitis Option B. Normal pressure hydrocephalus Option C. Pseudotumor cerebri Option D. None of them will improve with a lumbar puncture. Lumbar puncture is not only used to diagnose diseases, but can also be used to reverse symptoms of diseases. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is a condition where the ventricles enlarge and compress the surrounding tissues. If you want to know more about normal pressure hydrocephalus, 
check out my video on how to diagnose different types of dementia. When a lumbar puncture is performed in these patients, the excessive fluid can be drained so that the ventricles don't get distended and will cease to compress the surrounding tissues. This way, there can be some amount of symptomatic relief. Pseudotumor cerebri is a condition where there is an increased intracranial pressure without a known cause. Although the use of tetracycline and vitamin A are associated with it, there is no direct cause known. Hence, it is also known as idiopathic intracranial hypertension. The definitive treatment would be placing a shunt. But if this is being delayed due to some reasons, serial lumbar punctures can be done for symptomatically treating the patient. Lumbar puncture is extremely important for diagnosing and finding the cause in patients with meningitis. However, a lumbar puncture will not reverse the symptoms of meningitis. Meningitis has to be treated depending on what caused it. Two important pathologies of the lower back are Cordyquina syndrome and Conus medullaris syndrome. The Conus medullaris is basically the end of the spinal cord. It's around L1. It is shaped like a cone, so it's pretty easy to identify it. The nerve roots below it are known as the cauda equina. The word equina is associated with horses. Since this looks like a horse's tail, it wouldn't be hard for us to identify it. This very thin part, which extends beyond the meninges, is known as phylum terminale. To differentiate one syndrome from another, you need to know two rules. Higher the lesion, the more symmetric the dysfunction will be. And higher lesions will present like upper motor neuron lesions, while lower lesions will present as lower motor neuron lesions. Keep this picture in mind and you'll be able to answer all these questions. Question number one. Which of the following has hyperreflexia? Conus medullaris syndrome or cauda equina syndrome? Since conus medullaris is higher, it will present with hyperreflexia. Cauda equina syndrome, on the other hand, will present with hyperreflexia. Question number two. Which of the following has symmetric motor weakness? Cauda equina syndrome or conus medullaris syndrome? The answer to this question is conus medullaris syndrome. Going back to our rules, we mentioned that higher the lesion, the more symmetric is the weakness. Another way to remember this is by looking at this picture. The cone seems to be more symmetric, while the cauda equina looks asymmetric. Question number 3. Which of the following has radicular pain? I like to imagine it this way. The conus medullaris is more solid and fixed, and the cauda equina is free to move. So, conus medullaris is more likely to present with back pain since it's kind of like fixed to the back, while cauda equina syndrome is more likely to present with radicular pain. Question number four. Cauda equina syndrome has dash anesthesia. This might sound pretty lame, but this is how I remember it. Cauda equina is low, so it's feeling really sad about it. So this reminds me that cauda equina has saddle anesthesia and conus medullaris automatically has perianal anesthesia. Question number 5. Early onset bowel and bladder dysfunction is seen in cauda equina syndrome or conus medullaris syndrome. The answer to this question is conus medullaris syndrome. Conus medullaris is on top and is really quick, while cauda equina is low, hence the bowel and bladder dysfunction is slow. Please comment below to support me and share it with your friends to challenge them on this neuro quiz. If you're interested in more neurology videos and quizzes, check this playlist out. If you want some study tips, do watch this video. Thank you.